miles of land with no clouds in the sky. A little scorpion digs itself underground to escape the heat. No trees or bushes as far as the eye can see. A desert wasn't always like this. Most of them used to be covered with lush green and thick vegetation. Each desert is unique in its own way. It's defined as an area that receives less than 10 inches of rainfall per year. So, with barely any water to support life, the atmosphere is prone to extreme shifts of temperature. That's why a desert can be scorching hot during the day, but the temperatures drop significantly at night. As soon as the sun sets, all the heat disappears, since there's no atmospheric moisture to trap it inside. Jungles and rainforests stay warm at night, since the humidity acts as a net trapping the heat. These dry lands are a result of rain shadow. It's part of the weather cycle that creates precipitation. Damp, warm wind blowing from a certain direction hits a mountain and slowly rises up to form clouds. But as it goes higher, it begins to cool, which makes it release moisture. It's technically fog. So, as a result, the other side of the mountain can't retain any humidity. That's how it turns dry and barren. If we look at this on a regional scale, then you'd notice that deserts aren't even located near the mountains. A high-pressure system is when a flow of dry air remains near the surface. They can be found in subtropical or desert places. If the high-pressure system is consistent, then it's not easy for the opposite effect to take place, which causes typical weather patterns. Many deserts aren't even covered in sand. When walking through a desert, you're stepping on millions of years of nature doing its job. When the days are boiling hot and the nights teeth-chattering cold, the rocks tend to break down easily. The dryness and winds cause erosion and contribute to breaking down these rocks, exposing the bedrock underneath. And as time goes on, the rocks get smaller and smaller until the sand is produced. The larger chunks of sand sink to the bottom, while the smaller grain-like pieces remain on top. The wind transfers the sand in multiple directions and on other larger rocks. Over time, the sand constantly rubbing against the rocks will help it erode it until one day that rock will turn into sand. Dunes are the ocean waves of the desert. Sand dunes are unique in that they don't have a consistent shape. One day, you may see a dune sea in front of you, and the next day, it can be gone. Sand almost behaves like water. Try taking some dry sand with one hand and hold a fist. You'll notice the sand leaking out of your control as it spills. Sand is an accumulation of ground-up rocks shaped by the environment, wind, and gravity. Sand dunes can be found wherever there is a large plain of land and wind. So, beaches, deserts, and even abandoned farmlands have them. You can point out certain dunes depending on the vegetation. So, the ones on the beach have different composition and are smaller. But the ones that cover more ground have a flat or rippled surface. In such places, you can find sand sheets that stretch for miles ahead. Sandstorms form closer to the edges of the desert rather than in the middle. With no vegetation to shield and limit the storms, they can get pretty big. The wind starts off slow and then picks up pace, carrying many particles and exposing the ground below. The rest of the particles lying on the ground begin to vibrate. The stronger the wind, the more sand will be in your face. So the particles all bump into each other and carry the rest of them in the air. The sandstorm can be so huge that it blocks out the sun. In 2001, a sandstorm in China moved an estimated 6.5 million tons, covering an area of around 52 million square miles. About 80% of deserts aren't covered with sand, but rather with barren earth. With no plants and rainfall, the sun just bakes the ground as it is and holds everything in place. You can find hills and rock formations in deserts, many of them shaped by erosion. Some deserts have small mountains, too, and depending on the geologic elements, the color and hardness of the rock vary. But not any sandy patch of land is a real desert. The common ones are composed mainly of sand. There are some that are classified as pebble deserts, rock deserts, and even snow and ice ones. Cold deserts are found all over the world. The Gobi Desert, the coastal desert of Peru and northern Chile have those. There is no humidity around these places, so moisture can't be contained to make clouds. The biggest desert in the world is the whole continent of Antarctica. This giant icy wasteland has no rainfall, but dry winds similar to those in hot deserts. Ice and snow cover almost every square inch of the place that's only habitable by scientists and researchers, and a bunch of penguins. 
In the Sahara Desert, nomadic tribes wander around from place to place. They've been there for thousands of years and only know the desert life. It's estimated that there are only 2.5 million people living there, excluding the Nile Valley. That's one person per square mile. In the past, the Sahara had a lot more people. Evidence of stone artifacts and even art designed on rocks were found in various places. But those places are dried up, uninhabitable areas. Fossils show that the Sahara was once a large network of rivers and lakes, occupied by ancient extinct marine animals. That was millions of years ago. But just around 7,000 years ago, the Sahara was more vibrant with buffaloes, giraffes, elephants, and other animals that are currently found elsewhere in Africa. The people back then used to live near large Saharan lakes and relied on fishing for food. They created settlements around them while defending themselves from animal threats. A lot of those rivers dried up, but many remain as oases. An oasis is an area that has a fresh water source and fertile soil surrounded by dryness. People of the Sahara grew crops and planted trees for dates around the perimeter to prevent sand from contaminating the water and destroying the crops. Some of the water was brought in through irrigation of larger rivers or natural springs. There were also underground sources of water. The oasis could be as little as only a few date palms around the body of water to an entire city. They were perfect trading routes for merchants and nomads, often dealing dates, olives, figs, and other commodities. The settlers maintained the oasis for generations until now. Despite the oasis, there were still some nomads wandering around. But both settlers and nomads had domesticated livestock. Saharan people are still specialists when it comes to moving around. Many of them are trained blacksmiths or agriculturalists that follow to where they can thrive and prosper. Even though the desert climate and conditions are hostile for living beings, there are plenty of plants and animals that specialize in such conditions. The Attix antelope is a unique creature that's currently endangered. Its coat is unmistakable, and its horns are beautifully designed. Cool desert snakes that slither sideways disguise themselves in the same color as the sand. If the desert was the ocean, then camels would be the boats. Their humps store fat to cool themselves off when it gets too hot. The two-humped camel isn't native to the Middle East or Africa, but Mongolia and northern China. They have two rows of eyelashes for protection and can close and open their nostrils at will. No desert is complete without scorpions. They're extremely common in the Sahara and can grow to the size of your palm. Let's not forget the animals of the frozen deserts. Penguins are common in the Antarctic, as well as the Arctic fox and polar bears. Deserts don't technically grow in size just because sand spreads further. It works when the ecosystem takes over another land by decreasing vegetation and removing the fertile soil. And then you have more desert. This is the Burj Khalifa. It's the tallest building in the world. It has 163 floors, and it's twice as tall as the Empire State Building, and three times taller than the Eiffel Tower. The total weight of the concrete for the building's foundation is 110,000 tons. That's like 2,200 Boeing 737s, or 50,000 SUVs, or 69,000 hippos. It took 22 million human hours to build. That means that if you were to build Burj Khalifa by yourself, it would take you about 2,500 years to do it. And now, imagine that huge thing slowly sinking into the sand until even its spire is underground. Skyscrapers are usually built on solid ground. Take a skyscraper in New York and dig a little deeper under it. There's always some kind of rock foundation to support the weight of the building. But if you dig a hole in Dubai, you'll only find sand. In theory, the whole city should have sunk in the sand, but it's still there. The main reason the Burj Khalifa stands firm is that the sand for the building's foundation was brought from Australia. Wait, but Dubai is built in a desert. There are billions of tons of sand there. Well, that's right, but the problem is its shape. There are lots of dust storms there. The wind picks up sand grains. They rub against one another, get polished, and gradually turn into microscopic balls. This makes the sand doughy, almost like snow. And if you squeeze a handful of such sand, there will be a lot of air between these balls. 
That's because they don't cling to one another tightly. But usually, sand grains are shaped like diamonds. If you squeeze such sand in your hand, the grains will press against one another like puzzle pieces. This way, they can withstand intense pressure. So, engineers imported millions of tons of sand to Dubai to create a strong base for the foundation of the building. The second thing about this type of sand is friction. The less smooth it is, the harder it is for you to slide on it. The building will literally cling to the sand with its foundation. Now, let's sneak a peek underneath the Burj Khalifa. First, the engineers drilled 192 holes, each about 164 feet deep. That's three times the length of a New York City subway car. Then, these holes were filled with concrete and about 39,000 tons of steel rebars to reinforce the structure. These are called piles. Concrete resists compression well enough, but it doesn't fare well when it gets twisted or bent. Luckily, steel rebars are great at dampening those forces. The sand around the piles is tight against the concrete. The friction between the sand and the piles keeps them from falling deeper. It's like sticking your hand in the sand at the beach. It can easily go down a dozen inches, but then the friction will stop it. When the piles were ready, it was time to create the base of the building, something like a concrete pillow. It's shaped like a flower with three petals, but this is not only for beauty, it's also for reliability. When you step on doughy snow with your feet, you fall all the way down to more solid ground. But if you wear snowshoes, you can walk on the snow surface. This is because your weight is distributed over the snowshoe area. The shape of the base of the Burj Khalifa has the same function. It distributes the construction's weight evenly so that the building doesn't sink into the sand. When the base was ready, workers began constructing the building itself. Whoa, it really swings a bit. Don't worry, it's done on purpose so that the skyscraper doesn't collapse. If you make the construction too stiff and don't let it swing, at one point, a strong gust of wind can just break it at the very base, and it will fall. So all skyscrapers are made a bit flexible. When the wind blows, the skyscraper tilts a little. This puts a lot of force on one side of the building's foundation. But concrete tends to shrink slightly, which dampens that force. Then the concrete decompresses and returns back to normal. When the wind is especially strong, the spire of the Burj Khalifa can sway six and a half feet. The architects have come up with an even crazier idea for Dubai, a spinning building. It'll be an ordinary skyscraper, but each floor will rotate 360 degrees. Engineers are planning to install a rigid rod inside the skyscraper. It'll hold the entire weight of the construction on itself. Then each floor of the building will be attached to that rod, and the inhabitants of each floor will be able to choose the direction and speed of rotation. So, building on sand is actually quite reliable and simple. It was much harder to build skyscrapers in Manhattan. There's hard rock that can support a skyscraper there, but it lies 10 stories deep underground. So, engineers came up with a solution. These are wells. First, a concrete ring is placed on the ground. Workers start digging a hole right underneath it. They remove soft soil, and the concrete ring begins to sink under its own weight. The builders then put another ring on top of it and continue digging. One by one, the rings go lower and lower. A small crane helps to lift the soil to the surface. It's essentially a vertical tunnel that leads to nowhere. When the well reaches the rock hidden underneath the soil, the builders climb back to the top. The well is then filled with concrete. It looks like a giant pile. A dozen of these powerful piles can support a large skyscraper. But it's much harder to create a building foundation in a seismically active zone. That means a place where earthquakes frequently happen. The method of protection against them is simple. Like with high winds, you need to make the building flexible. Let's look at the foundation of such a construction. Good old piles hold the enormous weight of the skyscraper. But the concrete pad of the building itself stands on huge springs. During an earthquake, the ground shakes and moves from side to side but the springs dampen and compensate for the movement, so the building stays in place. Also, engineers surround buildings in earthquake zones with concrete circles underground. So here's a skyscraper with its foundation. Here's one ring around it, and here's another. When an earthquake hits and the ground starts to shake, these rings dampen the force of the earthquake. And if around the rings it feels like strong waves, inside the perimeter, it's like a calm bay. Another option is to reinforce the building with steel beams. You may have seen these things on bridge piers, but in this case, there are small cylinders on each beam. 
each cylinder is filled with oil and has a piston. When the building starts to swing during an earthquake, the piston starts to compress the oil in the cylinder. The oil turns the mechanical energy from the swinging into heat. This dampens the energy released by the earthquake. And sometimes, engineers have to construct a building in a place where there's a lot of water in the soil. If you drill a hole for a pile there and fill it with concrete, the water will wash out the cement or keep it from drying out. In such cases, you have to freeze that water. To do it, builders make a lot of small drill holes at the construction site. Then they put pipes into these holes and create a connected pipe system. There's a similar pipe system in your fridge. It's hidden under the inner paneling. Now, we pump some liquid nitrogen inside. The water gives off its heat to the liquid nitrogen and starts to freeze. Meanwhile, the workers have time to fill the pile holes with concrete. But water in its ice form takes up more space than in liquid form. So when the ice melts, the ground sags a little. So what if you want to build a city on water, like Venice? Then you'll need long piles. The builders of Venice used wooden ones. They had to get to the bottom of the lagoon first. And then they moved a few more dozen feet deeper through the soft clay soil until they reached the hard rock. The builders drove such piles around the perimeter of the future building. And the construction itself was built in such a way that most of its weight rested on the outer walls. If you dive underwater in Venice, you'll see hundreds of thousands of such piles. The task is more difficult if you build a bridge. In addition to a solid foundation, you have to take into account thermal expansion. The rule is simple. When something gets hot, it expands. And when it cools, it shrinks. Look at railroads. There is a gap between each rail. The clatter of the wheels you hear when on a train is born exactly on these gaps. When the sun heats the rails in the summer, they extend. This creates tension inside the metal. Then the rail can bend sideways or even upward like a worm. But if engineers have provided such gaps, the metal will expand and fill that space. A bridge is exactly the same as a huge rail. And in hot weather, it can expand too. So engineers leave gaps there on purpose. You can see them on the surface of the bridge. They're usually covered with a sheet of metal that looks like a comb. When the bridge heats up, these combs come together. Millions of years ago, there were seas and oceans where deserts are today. What if it all comes back? Water instead of sand, where deserts used to be. Life on the planet would change completely. Sand can act like a liquid if a strong enough airflow makes it rise from below. The air reduces friction between sand particles, making more space. The particles begin to move freely, as if they're in a liquid. If a huge vent suddenly opened under the Earth's crust, blowing air from beneath, then perhaps the entire landscape would begin to sink like being in quicksand. Such monuments as the Egyptian pyramids or the Sphinx would sink under the ground. Huge cities built on sand would disappear. The Sahara Desert would resemble one bubbling cauldron. Camel caravans would simply fall down. But don't worry, the animals wouldn't get hurt. Liquid sand is filled with oxygen, so they'd be able to swim in it. But what if sand turned into water instead of just a liquid version of itself? If this happened quickly and unexpectedly, then disasters would occur on all the beaches of the world. Imagine you're sunbathing on an air mattress on a sandy beach of a seaside resort. You're wearing sunglasses, the sea waves are tickling your heels, gulls are squawking overhead, and you have iced tea in your hands. A perfect holiday. But then, you feel your mattress moving, a wave hits you, you take off your glasses and find yourself in the middle of the sea. The entire beach has turned into water. It reaches way up to the road where cars drive and houses stand. You help people who were sunbathing nearby to climb on the mattress. You swim to the new shore, head home, turn on the TV, and see this is happening all over the world. Hundreds of thousands of beaches are flooded. Water overflows city streets and houses. People are scared. Some leave their homes, while others take surfboards and ride the waves. And while part of the world is trying to cope with a global flood of sandy shores, a fifth ocean is being formed at the same time. You get on a plane and fly over the largest sandy desert on the planet. The area of the Sahara Desert is 3.5 million square miles. This is almost the area of the entire USA. Billions of tons of sand turned into water in an instant. And all this water starts to spill over. 
animals living in the sand, such as jerboa, scorpions, cobras, and many others, disappear from the face of the planet. The nearest countries are devastated by the flood. The new ocean connects to the Mediterranean, Red, and Tyrrhenian seas. The water level in the world's oceans is rising so much that most island countries have to evacuate to continents. In coastal cities, people sit in cafes and enjoy life. Some are sunbathing, while others try to escape from the heat and the shade. Suddenly, the wind rises and a shadow appears on the ground. People look at it, puzzled, and it keeps growing. Everyone looks up and sees that a huge tsunami is approaching the shore. Desert countries have it even worse. They're flooded at once and turn into many small divided islands. And huge waves will hit the shores of port towns for a long time. The hottest places on the planet have become wet. Hot sands turned into almost boiling water. It quickly evaporates and forms huge rain clouds. Thanks to high humidity, the air pressure changes and strong winds begin to blow. They drive clouds all over the planet. Long rains begin all over the world, drenching everything. Water mixes with the world's oceans and cools down. The hottest places in the world are getting colder. With temperatures changing, tornadoes and hurricanes form in different parts of the world and ravage the planet. The face of the whole Earth is warping. New seas, lakes, and rivers form all over the world. Before, water comprised 70% of the planet's surface. Now, it's 90%. Fortunately, cataclysms don't last long. Even though sands cover a lot of land, they're not very thick. The depth of the ocean is hundreds of times deeper than the depth of sand in a desert. In some, the sand is only a few inches thick. Only the largest dunes may reach 150 feet in thickness. The water levels will rise drastically and will probably never return to what they used to be. But at least the weather will calm down sooner or later. But something bad is still going to happen. Every year, 2 billion tons of dust rise into the air. Most of it comes from deserts. Particles of this dust contain useful elements and bacteria. The wind carries them all over the planet. A quarter of this dust comes to rest in seas and oceans. Bacteria and nutrients feed small creatures in the ocean, such as phytoplankton or krill. These creatures, in their turn, are food for small fish and even whales. And the fish are food for predators, as well as for many land animals. So, if sands turn into water, the ocean will lose a lot of its nutrients. The good news is that it won't last long either. Nutrients and bacteria will adapt to the new conditions and will be able to evaporate with water, which condenses into rain clouds. The largest variety of the marine world lives in shallow waters not far from the coast. The desert turned into water gives ideal conditions for new life to develop. New species of animals appear that can survive in hot water. Many creatures that lived in hot sands have now adapted to marine life. Camels have learned to swim, and small reptiles can hold their breath underwater for a long time. Thanks to hot weather and shallowness, a huge amount of seaweed grows on the bottom that can withstand high temperatures. The new ocean now resembles a multicolored garden of marine plants. People are also trying to adapt. They build towns on massive wooden structures right on the water and attach them to the bottom with long chains. Fishing has become the main source of food for all humankind. Cars have become obsolete. Everyone wants boats. Famous expensive car brands now design luxury yachts and ships. Also, everyone learns to swim, and every resident of sea cities is an excellent swimmer. All the new water was fresh until it mixed with the sea and gained its saltiness. People have created special filters that turn this water fresh. Global stocks are increasing. There are almost no places left in the world where people don't have enough water. But what if our situation became stranger still, and all the sand on the planet, not only on beaches and in deserts, turned into liquid? All hourglasses in the world would accelerate because the water flows much faster than sand. Sand is also used for all types of construction works. They use it in the production of concrete and to lay a strong foundation. It would be impossible to create bricks and clay without sand. Almost all houses, not counting wooden ones, would simply fall apart. But 
wooden houses could just rot because of the high humidity levels. Sand is used for glass. Production of mirrors, windows, and light bulbs would be greatly reduced. World reserves of drinking water would decrease as sand is a natural filter for purification. There would be huge traffic jams on the roads because, well, there would be no roads to speak of. Imagine you're driving a car and its wheels turn into jelly. Road vehicles would be severely affected. Planes would also stop flying because sand is used in the construction of the runway. The only means of transportation left would be ships. Sand is present almost everywhere on our planet, so the water would begin to moisten and wash away the soil. The whole world would turn into a vicious marsh, and it would be very difficult to move around. The humidity levels would increase significantly, and thick fogs would appear every day. A huge number of scolopendras, salamanders, frogs, and other creatures that love humidity would take over the planet. Some insects may evolve and increase in size thanks to the new ideal conditions. And people, if they survive at all, might grow scales to better transfer moisture. The Earth would look like a planet from a sci-fi movie. But fortunately, this isn't going to ever happen. Octopuses have three hearts. Two of them pump blood to the gills, while the bigger heart circulates blood to the rest of their body. They also have nine brains. There's the large central one, but also each of their eight arms has a mini brain of its own, which is why they can act independently. Since each arm has its own brain, the central brain only needs to send a higher level signal to the arm. Things like, move to that nearby crevice, there might be a crab hiding inside. In the case of humans, the brain would guide and take control of each movement of our legs and arms. And with an octopus, arms act almost independently on their way to the crevice. It also tastes and feels with the suction cups on it. Since their arms are so independent, an octopus doesn't actually know where they are unless it sees them. The human body has an ability called proprioception. Thanks to it, we know where our arm is, even if we hold it, let's say, behind our back. 1816 is known as the year when summer didn't come. In April 1815, there was a massive explosion on Mount Tambora in Indonesia. It sent enormous clouds of volcanic ash up into the atmosphere. The majority of the northern hemisphere got covered with a shroud of dust and dirt and kind of refused to settle. In June of the following year, the cold winter didn't just come to an end. Frost damaged crops and snow and rain persisted during the whole summer. In Iceland, you'll find some of the most breathtaking sceneries on our planet. Jagged mountains, fjords, hot geysers, ice fields carved into the landscape. Stunning yet intriguingly black sand beaches, such as Reynisfjara Beach. Most of the sand on beaches is generally formed from rocks that have broken down because of weather changes and erosion through thousands or even millions of years. And on Reynisfjara, the sand is a striking black color, and that's because of volcanic activity. Lava came out of an erupting volcano, got to the surface, cooled, and then hardened in the Atlantic Ocean, creating such a fascinating black hue. This beach is so magically stunning, but it's also very dangerous because of its sneakier waves. That's when a few smaller waves join together into a single, really big one. This phenomenon can happen when ocean currents force waves together, or in the case of Rainosphera, when such waves come from an offshore underground cliff and get an even stronger pulling effect. Considering the ocean's low temperatures too, it's definitely better to just take pictures from a safe spot. Some trees talk to each other. Yeah, not the way we do, of course, but for example, acacia trees that grow over the African savanna can warn each other if there's something dangerous coming. When some animals, such as antelopes, gobble up its leaves, the tree immediately starts producing more tannin, which is toxic to animals. They also emit a special type of gas that travels through the air and warns other trees they should protect themselves too. You're stargazing, such a chill night, and then a flash of bright light streaks through the night sky. A shooting star, so cool. But what we see is not actually a star, although we call it that way. They're meteors, which are basically small chunks of dust and rock moving through space. As they're passing through our atmosphere, they cause something called friction when one thing rubs against another. And that's why they glow. Also, the friction causes heat. 
dust and rocks get extremely hot as they fly through the atmosphere, and the heat makes them glow until the moment they burn out and turn into what we call the shooting star. Sunsets in deserts are extremely beautiful because of the spectacular colors they produce a bit more than elsewhere. Sunlight consists of various shades of the color spectrum. When the sun is high in the sky, these colors mix together and our eyes see them as white. But as the sun gets lower, its rays have to go through a thicker layer of atmosphere before they get to us. The atmosphere then scatters shorter wavelengths of light, like blue and purple, before we can even see them. That's why the longer orange and red wavelengths stand out. In urban environments, air pollution can make sunset colors duller than everywhere. The clean air in deserts allow the vivid colors coming from the sun to shine through at twilight. Also, the moisture, water vapor, and rain engorged clouds can mute the sunset's hues. Since there's no rain, clouds are thin and wispy, so they filter and reflect sunlight instead of blocking it. Bamboo grows really fast. It's actually the fastest growing plant on Earth, sometimes growing about 3 feet in just one day. You can find it in dense forests, where only a little light gets to the ground, which means bamboo is under strong pressure to reach the sunlight as quickly as it can. There's an underground stem that connects bamboo shoots to their parent plant, so the shoot doesn't really need leaves of its own until it gets to its full height. Also, bamboo grows faster than other plants because it doesn't waste its time and energy on growing rings that thicken the stalk. It's just a thin, hollow stick that grows straight up. You'll notice some of the big trees have shallow root systems, sometimes even 10 inches deep in the ground. The roots generally need access to oxygen and water, and they can mostly find it in special underground pockets called soil pores. When a tree has ideal moisture and soil conditions, it can send roots deeper down under the surface and get what it needs. But most of the time, conditions are not perfect, considering bedrock, stones, and compact soil that physically prevents the roots from going down. Such obstacles also prevent the roots from getting the needed oxygen. So, when life gets tough, the tree will take an easier option. Its roots will stay close to the surface and spread out in different directions. Drought conditions are another reason trees can have shallow root systems. By staying closer to the surface, they can take most of the rainfall collection. Plants are exposed to the sunlight most of the time, but they still don't get sunburned. They appeared on land about 700 million years ago. And one of the key things they needed to survive was something that would protect them against the ultraviolet rays coming from the sun. Those in the sea had seawater as protection. UV radiation is mostly responsible for sunburn, so land plants developed a special protein that detects it. This protein sends signals to the cells to protect the plant from the damage and effects of UV radiation. Basically, it's like they produce their own natural sunscreen. But this still doesn't mean they're 100% protected. You know that common belief that if you water plants in the midday sunshine, this can cause their sunburn? Some think droplets of water act as tiny lenses and then focus the sunlight onto the leaf surface. But they're not strong enough to actually focus sunlight from a water droplet onto the surface of a leaf. It's just that their natural sunscreen doesn't mean total protection. Too much exposure to UV radiation damages cells in the leaves and bark of the majority of plants. Earth's core is as hot as the surface of the sun. You'd think it could easily melt our entire planet, especially since the core is only 1,800 miles away from the surface. If the sun were so close, we'd be like french fries. But we're alive because the center of the sun is surrounded by a mantle of rock that's mostly solid. The crust we walk on actually floats on that mantle and protects us. If the sun was close, we'd only have empty space to protect us, and you and I wouldn't be talking. Also, to melt the entire planet, you'd need way more energy than the heat in its core. So there. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.